Coming to you from UBN Studios in Burbank, California. You are listening to the Unsugarcoated Podcast with your host, Ali Alanius. Hey there, everybody. How are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome to Unsugarcoated with Alia, another episode where we just want to have a conversation and let you listen in and uh, put out some different perspectives. So as I've become a little bit accustomed, I'm going to share another one of mine today. Uh, In an answer to hateful rhetoric and fear, as a mother of four, I set out to write a story fighting, stereotyping, educating us on how racism dehumanizes society. In 2009, I released the historical fiction novel, Jugend, meaning youth in German. Jugend has since been named the top multicultural fiction novel of 2019 by the Global Ebook Awards, awarded the 2019 Bronze Medal and the Reader's Favorite Awards, and named the winner of the 2020 Book Excellent Awards, all in the multicultural fiction category. I am a person of multicultural background. I am both the daughter of an immigrant through my father and through my mother I have roots that span well over 150 years in America. I have ancestors that owned plantations and fought on the Confederate side of the Civil War after coming from Germany and other parts of Europe. I never intend to share my history like that as if I'm proud of it, but rather because all too often my appearance doesn't seem to qualify me to some who identify as white Americans. And so I have to let them know, don't judge this book by its cover. While some may see it as a curse, as if I'm confused on who I am, I take it as a blessing. I am not one thing, and I refuse to be asked to choose amongst any parts of me. I think when it comes to America, The concept I'm grappling these days with is the term minority. You see, I am a minority, but I'm not. This country, like the world, has existed long enough to where the majority of people are technically of multiple backgrounds, cultures, and even religions. One of the many things I am passionate about is reminding people that the world world of diversity is here. And it isn't going anywhere. If you're worried worried that the world is going to become so mixed up that you can't identify what a person is simply by looking at their skin, it's too late. It is time to honor every part of you and be one of those who push forward the agenda of unity and inclusion because I can't lie. If I took a DNA test today, who knows how many countries you might see come up on my profile. I'm sure like yours, it would be many. That doesn't mean I've lost culture. I embrace all parts of me. And while I can't give you a proper breakdown on the generation of lives that exist in my blood, I can tell you that I'm 100% human. And that is the only percentage that matters to me. So today I'm happy to be joined by someone who can probably not only relate to my advocacy on multiculturalism, but a man who is familiar with sharing perspectives that shed light on issues around the world. So let's bring him on to discuss culture as well as coronavirus, one of the major topics of discussion in our world as we continue to face a global pandemic. Dr. Calvin Sun is currently a practicing attending physician and clinical assistant professor in emergency medicine, phobographer, activist, and entrepreneur based in New York City. He is also the founder of and CEO of the Monsoon Diaries, a blog turned travel community that has been featured on BBC News, ABC News, MSNBC, TED, National Ge- Geographic, and USA Today. Now practicing as an attending physician at multiple under- underserved emergency departments and large scale events around the country, Calvin has been most recently notable for his firsthand reporting on the 2019 to 20 coronavirus pandemic in New York City emergency rooms. One of the most active public speakers in the Asian American. American speaking circuit, please welcome Dr. Calvin Sun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story too. And what Thank a wonderful introduction. It's such an honor to have this conversation with you. One, because I've of course been really hungry to find somebody who's willing to have this conversation from a medical perspective and what we're seeing and how coronavirus really is impacting us in the medical world and even culturally, you know, to some extent. So you're today talking to us from New York City. And, you know, actually, thank you. I have to remind remind myself of something. I have to thank you for introducing me to a new term, phoblographer. Oh, <laughs> I wish I could make that up. Same with emergentologist. Uh, everyone's like, wow, I love these words. That, and I'm like, I love them too. That's why I'm using them, but right. I can't take credit for inventing them. So to but speak to that, where did that, so you in, in that, so that I assume that represents photographer, blogger, 
And yeah. right. So you document a reporter. I write. Uh, I don't just take photos and just stand there, uh, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But I more of a I need to say something of describing what I take photos of uh, and uh, usually in the lens of a traveler. Right. But when you're a traveler, you're also human and you do have your own uh, biases and, uh, you know, lenses in which to perceive the world and whatever political or cultural lens that you want to say something about. And you can't stay neutral if sure. you, you know, think do about you, the world that way. Do you feel traveling really breaks kind of some of those glasses or those things that people put on? I feel that when I do have conversations with certain people, the more that they travel and they're familiar with other parts of the world and every other cultures, they seem to have a, a, it's interesting, I guess what would be considered more of a liberal mindset. I don't know why, but just this more, to me, it's just more open. It's just more humanitarian in that sense with not speaking to politics. Like you've gone out there, you've seen it. Do you feel like that is uh, an experience you've, you've seen happen or have, have experienced yourself? It's twofold. It's a chicken and egg argument. My background is I've now lead communities of groups of people traveling around the world. So I've seen many different types of travelers. And I like to believe that travel does at least create the environment and provide the opportunity to break those glasses and put on new ones and see the world through different lenses. However, uh, it's chicken and the egg. Were those people interested in traveling because they were already of a liberal mindset uh, or they you know, became liberal from traveling? And that being said, there's also plenty of travelers who travel all the time and are so entrenched in their point of view and thinking and stay, what do you say, closed-minded, sure. uh, judgmental. I've seen that the most well-traveled people want to fit in their view of the world into a nice little, mm. I guess, box that they created oh, yeah. for themselves. Yeah. And we sure. call them tourists. Right. They're the ones who check <laughs> off boxes and then they see and they have a preformed opinion and they seek only things that validate that confirmation bias. And I can't judge them. Sure. And there are plenty more, though, encouragingly, yeah. that yeah. go in without any expectations no boxes and just let the world to fill theirs and come out with new opinions. I love that you say that. I love that. I think I do the same thing. I, you know, like I said beforehand, when, when we got on, it's, it's a conversation. It's, it's, there is so many different things to consider, so many different perspectives, so many different nuances. And we're not here to, to talk about each and every single one of those, you know, we, or to defend them, I should say, or to, to speak on them. But it's interesting. I love that you do that. You, you, you have a similarity to me in that I can sense kindred spirits. So um, do me a favor, please, uh, Dr. San. I mean, you've been very, uh, you've been on Katie Couric, you've been on different shows, and I, and, and I applaud you for being someone, a voice, a leader within our communities and sharing what has coronavirus, from a personal journey perspective, if you wouldn't mind sharing some of your personal journey of coronavirus with our audience? I think it's been full of irony. My, my entire life has been full of irony. And coronavirus and COVID-19 isn't a new part of my life. It's more just a different way of living something that I've been already familiar with. I grew up through tragedy. Uh, I have been learning to more run towards and embracing trauma than waiting for it. Uh, and uh, as a child, a lot of traumas had happened. Mm -hmm. And the attitude I, that came from that experience was to now develop an attitude being more proactive. And hence, that's why I chose emergency medicine as my specialty uh, and to really run towards the fire and be there and always be prepared for anything, anytime, anywhere, anyone. And COVID-19 is just an illustration of my entire lifetime of always being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just a new challenge for me to uh, uphold. Uh, but the, the only difference is this time other people were being hurt, people that I cared about, my colleagues, my own family members. And the irony is that where I always believe in being resilient and you know taking care of yourself before you can take care of others, I realized that uh, I was doing so well up to that point when COVID came around where even though I was still okay coming home every day, all this exposure without a lack of PPE, without any symptoms, I thought I was okay. It's the story of my life. Like I always find a way to you know dodge bullets and be flexible and adaptable. But then my grandfather died from COVID. I have family and friends, other family and friends uh, who got sick from COVID, went on life support, on ICU. I've intubated my own colleagues and nurses uh, all around the city uh, where I work. And it's just that is a, you know, another different way of pr approaching a, a kind of tragedy and trauma that I'm not very much used to. I've always been a lone wolf, and now I realize that we're all this in this together. Sure. Uh, and yeah, it's been I, difficult. 
I want to take a moment and just go back. You know, you lost. I, I'm aware you lost your grandfather. My my deepest condolences in that sense. I I was very close to my own grandfather. And please, you know, from a so taking yourself out of the medical person, you know, you're now you saw your grandfather die from this disease. Uh, how did that make you feel in that moment? As far as being a physician and then having, you know, you have to take that hat off and now you're just a grandson. I think it's emblematic of a childhood that I grew up when those of them who are listening who know my story, I was never taken seriously by anybody, whether it was my parents or colleagues, friends growing up, um, what I want to do with my life and let alone my own entire medical training. I was always doubted whether I was going to fail out of medical school because I was running this travel blog on the side. And it was no different as a fam, you know, as a family member, as a grandson, being treated as the little kid who was considered a black sheep, uh, which is ironic because I ended up being a doctor anyway, but I became a doctor because I lost a bet. And they, I mean, my family knew the story. My grandfather knows the story. He wanted me to you know, be a doctor for a uh, different kind of doctor to make a lot of money and be prestigious where I wanted to, you know, work in underserved communities and be there for anytime, anyone, anywhere. And emergency medicine was not something that he had in uh, mind for me. So when he, uh, but we, I mean, I love him in my own way. Uh, it's different I generations. Trust me, uh, he didn't speak my love language, but I still, you know, that's, we still love each other. Uh, it gets to a point though, when you get COVID-19 and he got sick, he got a fever and I called him on the phone and he sounded great, actually. He was not short of breath. He can hold his breath for 10 seconds. He could have done just fine staying at home without seeking medical care because I was there. Uh, there was nothing a hospital could do for him that he can't already do at home. But he decided not to listen to me, which is something I'm used to growing up, and went to the hospital anyway. And that's when things happen in the hospital where, you know, to the best of their ability, but that's sometimes medical care is not always completely harmless. Sure. Uh, he went down, he circled the drain and, and then ultimately died with two chest tubes, a collapsed lung from too much oxygen and a transfusion from those chest tubes uh, and COVID-19 and probably a higher viral load exposure from going to COVID-19 alone underneath an unfamiliar ceiling with nobody next to him except for strangers dressed in astronaut suits where well, he could have stayed at home. He may have died, but at least he would have been here with his wife, my grandmother right. of 60 years, holding his hand in a familiar environment without two chest tubes in pain. Uh, that is the moral injury that we live with and that I live with personally. We live in as a doctors, but you ask me to take off that hat, but mm -hmm. I live with as a grandson that if he had stayed at home and died, people would have said, you're the worst grandson ever. You should have let him send him to the hospital. Right. We don't live in that reality, but I actually would have still preferred that scenario where he would have been with his wife sure. than alone. That's the moral injury that I deal with. So, I mean, in this, I'm asking a separate question, sort of, but so as a doctor and as a grandson, having gone through that, how does it make you feel when, of course, one of the biggest things is, is this is fake, this isn't real, this isn't a threat, this, there's no pandemic, you know, how does that make you feel when you, he I hear the, when you hear those comments? It is exhausting. My life has been full of exhaustion. Uh, and I can't even you know, speak to the people with less privilege than I do. I mean, I can't imagine what they go through and how much more exhausting their lives are. But it is, you know, taking away what we call spoons or, you know, my manner, my energy. And mm -hmm. it's so much more I can do when I'm, you know, barraged by all these people who doubt what we do and doubt the, the enemy that we face. But that is also what I signed up for. I'm not condoning that behavior, but also I can't change that. I can't force someone to think differently. I can't force someone to do something against their will or think against their will. Uh, my job is to clean up and put out the fires, to p clean up the messes that they cause and to keep my head up and keep going, recharge when I have to. This is why I'm a per diem emergency medicine physician, not a full-time because mm -hmm. I need to have the flexibility to take off when I can. I work whenever and wherever I want to work because I know my limits. Uh, I also have a travel company. So I, that's my how I recharge, but I can't travel all the time and I can't work all the time. So it's that balance that I force for myself. So when people dis disbelieve what I do and this virus and this this thing, like I have to rely on myself to be recharged because I know that's I, that's something I cannot change. Right. And to them, I, I also compel them to understand that they have to take ownership and responsibility for whatever actions and beliefs that they espouse that leads to terrible outcomes. If they don't believe it's a virus and they go out and they catch it because they don't take precautions and they give it to their grandmother at home because they didn't believe it and the grandmother gets it and then she goes to the ER and then dies like my grandfather did, they have to take responsibility for that. I'm still going to take care of them. Sure. I'm still going to take care of their family, sure. but they will have to own that. 
Absolutely. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned that about the spoons and I'm a three-time cancer survivor, Dr. Sun as well. And, um, I'm also, as a result of my battles, I have two autoimmune diseases, one being rheumatoid arthritis, actually pretty aggressively, and Sjogren's. Uh, so I often joke with people, I'm like, they always say, oh, you look great for your age. I'm like, yes, but I still feel like a 90-year-old woman inside. Trust me. And uh, so I'm very familiar with what you mean with spoons, how everything takes the energy, you know, and, and, and I'm only diverting off to that point because when you say that as well, the accountability for which you can take it home and give it to your grandmother. I very much am one of those people that struggle and say, oh, I mean, well, technically I am a grandmother. I do recognize that for everyone who reminds me, I just became a grandmother in January, but mm -hmm. I'm not the grandmother who's ready to go yet. And in all honesty, I mean, I'm just going to be pretend I, we're not in a technical encounter. I have an autoimmune. I, I've just told you some of my history. Am I somebody who should be going out, walking around without a mask and just kind of taking this very haphazardly? in your medical opinion? It depends where you live. It depends on your risk tolerance and it depends on what you consider living versus existing. Sure. It, it's all a balance. There's no black and white. Uh, people can, if you want to minimize completely to zero your risk, then stay at home. Don't talk to anyone. Don't do a podcast. Don't talk to me. Right. Don't enrich yourself. Don't even order books because the books right. can carry the virus. Exactly. <laughs> All right. And, but that's not possible. That's not practical. Some people can live like that. Right. And we're not we're not speaking to that. We're speaking to someone who's full of life, who needs to connect with other human beings, who probably uh, one of your love language is human connection mm, and absolutely. touch and talking to other people. But we don't want you to go overboard either and hurt other people in doing so. Then that's the guilt that we you know may harbor after that happens. So it's that delicate balance. You go back and forth. Sure. And, and but if someone what, goes it, out and thinks that they it's not just, you know, I mean, I I could be one of the, the people's subject and I don't fit in that technical category for someone's, you know, for someone's mindset. And so that's where I know I've been very vocal and kind of feeling like, hey, guys, you know, not all the grandma and grandpas are the only ones who are at risk, obviously. And I and I live in L.A. where we are very it's very heavy. I was just telling my best friend when I was getting out of the car, she said, well, we're in Dallas. We, we got like another 300 cases today. And I said, well. I'd love it if we were only getting 300 cases because technically here in L.A., because I, I constantly and I actually I'm going to make an honest confession. I more monitor the deaths, to be honest. That's just me. That's what I prefer to monitor versus the at least that are being reported uh, with uh, the, and the. But the cases are still I notice that there's still over a thousand cases being reported a day in Los Angeles. So, you know, and obviously with the protests as much as I, I do support the message obviously I'm aware that there is a risk there and we can't deny that and nor should we so being safe and effective what I know you we should you talked about observing as an emergency uh, staff for the protests when you're looking out at the crowd as, as a medical physician tell me you know what you would like to see everyone doing and what you have observed for the most part maybe or I'm sure it's varied but you know just in general what would you like to see everyone doing I, mean, I can only speak to where I live and work in New York City, but the numbers are very, very low. And even if there were no pandemic, you should be putting on face coverings and uh, a mask and sun eyewear, eye protection, because that's protest 101. You don't want to be identified if, you, if that's against your will because of fear of retribution by an employer or someone who's against the protest who wants to, you know, sabotage or, you know, to create chaos from within. So that's something that we have been doing even before. Four. So with the pandemic, it actually kills two birds with one stone by still engaging the same tactics as before. Maybe a little more social distancing, but you know, protests are outdoors. Sure. We're trained to be, we, everyone, the American right to protest is that you're supposed to stay outdoors and be mobile and constantly moving and constantly, you know, taking different positions. And in case anything bad happens, you're, you have a way out and you have a buddy system that looks out for you. Sure. Uh, that's that, those are things that I think are very difficult to spread COVID-19. They're not very conducive to viral spread, mm -hmm. staying outdoors, wearing masks and being constantly mobile. Uh, a month ago, people were out in Central Park staying in the same place next to the same people for hours, not right. wearing masks, picnicking and no fault in their own. Like I also did something similar last week. I mean, three weeks in already where the numbers have stayed low. Right. Which so is picnicking good. Picnicking Central Park, that area is still literally dropping in terms of cases and deaths. So now with that knowledge, armed with that, the power of the knowledge, I think it's safe to 
do what I just did a, a week ago. I had to wait three weeks for mm-hmm. me to com- feel comfortable to do a picnic of my own. And still seven weeks, seven days later, none of us are sick. Right. And right. now with the protest where everyone's more mobile than the people picnicking Central Park, I just, my brain, my logical brain is going to say, that I think that's okay. Right, right. And that's good. I mean, I think that that eases some stress for some people, you know, um, hopefully. And I'm, I would love I'm going to I'm going to make as, as an honest statement. I would love for this to not be as real as it is. And I would love for it to not be as big of a threat as it potentially could be. And so I but I am also aware we don't know. We just don't know enough information. And given what you guys did go through in New York, it was very tragic. And to to see people arguing about the reality that people were dying and that you know, I mean, I can you actually I shouldn't I don't want to speak for you, your personal experience. Please share with me that your medical experience with it when it really when it when did it really come to you that like, OK, this is an issue like this is this is crazy. Sorry, I'm, I guess well, crazy is not the best word, but I mean, when when did you really understand the gravity of the situation? COVID-19? Yes. Oh, uh, I think my my opinion of the virus changed over to like, literally within a minute on my first shift back uh, on March 8th. Uh, or not even, probably a week before. I was leading a two-week trip in Angola uh, from the end of February to March 7th up until 11 p.m. I had to like remember. And in March 8th is was my first ship, literally, I think, 10 hours after I landed in Newark Airport. Uh, nobody stopped me in the airport. So I was like, oh, I guess everything's fine. But all the literature I was getting, all the podcasts, and then the first couple hours when all the patients started coming in, uh, uh, from with COVID-19 or worried about having COVID-19 and we didn't have enough tests, let alone where to send a test to. That was when I realized this was no joke that right. uh, we didn't have enough PPE and a lot of pe- more people were starting to look sick than uh, we had expected. And I only trust what I see in front of me. Sure, uh, I can read papers. I can read data. I can read numbers. Those are all supplementary auxiliary things that fill some aspect, complement what my l- visual learn experience is. But I don't believe anything unless I see it for myself. And I'm glad I work in, in the emergency room where I am the first person to see everything. Mm-hmm. That's that had to be an interesting moment. I have to tell you, I was I had actually flown back in early January after the new year. I'd flown out to, ta- to Dallas and I have three kids and my husband and myself. We flew out there. We flew back. And on um, January 29th, I was in the ER with her at Cedar sinai uh, because it's, it's mm-hmm. less than a mile from my house or about a mile from my house. And she had 104.9 temperature for several days. It was I and I remember because I'm, I'm a, she's my fourth child. My oldest is 23. I've been a mother over half of my life. OK, and it's I'm not a doctor, That's but I've great. actually been right over. I've been in the ER with a doctor, Dr. Son, and I'm like, run this test because I think and then like, well, we, we don't think. And then they come back. They're like, wow, you're right. And like it just you spend enough time caring for other human beings. You begin to learn a couple things. Right. And symptoms and things. And I had never had any of my kids uh have a fever that high and for that long because it went on for a few days nobody else in the house my my 13 year old no my 15 year old son excuse me he's almost 15 he he got a couple sniffles and stuff about a week later my other daughter had a little cough but nobody else got very sick I cannot tell you how many times the conversation has been had in my house of did she have it and I guess I have a question as far as like what do you say to those people who kind of don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I know that there's some antibody tests and things like that, but I mean, I, I mean, I'm just asking because, yeah, I don't know. Am I alone in feeling like that? Is there other people out there who are just convinced our kids may have had it? I mean, it really, unless you think that it will change your behavior dramatically moving forward, it doesn't really matter if you had it or you didn't have it. Just That's a good point. do your best as a member of the community, part of a social contract to protect other people the best you can without sacrificing too much of your convenience, but at the same time knowing that we're in different times. So if the antibodies test is literally across the street from you and you're not going to expose yourself to other people, you can range at 6 a.m. in and out in the empty waiting room or like 5 p.m. You know, after everyone's gone and get an antibodies test, that's so different from doing a two-hour commute on the New York City subway to get to you know, your primary doctor uh, to and then potentially expose yourself to all these other people and yourself just to get an antibodies test that you know may not change your behavior ultimately whether it's positive or negative. 
But if it may change your behavior, whether it's for work or if you're a frontline healthcare worker, right. or it gives you an idea whether you feel safer to visit your immunocompromised friend or your, you know, grandparents or guardians, then please, then by all means, that does shift it towards doing it. it I can't really tell you what is one size fits all kind of approach. Yeah. You only need to be the yeah best. No, I mean, I'm sure I, I, I appreciate that. And I, I think it was, it just, it's, it's, I know I'm not alone in that sense of feeling. And, and I think, you know, there's this part of you that's like, what do you do now? My daughter's only three years old or she's three and a half. And, um, sorry, I'm always getting all my kids ages wrong. That's what happens when you have too many of them. <laughs> I don't even call them by the right name half the time. As long as you don't have favorites. They're all your favorites. I tell them all they're my favorite, okay? <laughs> they can never listen yeah. to this podcast. Now I'll have to cut that part out because they'll be like, we told you. They always tell me you tell us that. Okay, um, so speaking from a cultural perspective, if you don't mind me asking if you've seen or if you experienced anything, because of course people love to jump on the Chinese flu, there is, you know, people trying to associate it. You've seen, you know, you see greater, you know, I don't like it when I see it. I get very frustrated. I get very upset. And I want to ask what you've seen, how you feel about that, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. I acknowledge that this happens and people feel that way. I acknowledge that actions and, and statements like that happen in the world. And I acknowledge that definitely it is very real that, um, uh, violence born out of racism and prejudice is happening to members of my community uh, in New York City and beyond. However, I can only speak to my personal experience. I feel very privileged to live in Manhattan, New York, born and raised all my life. And to recognize my privilege as a six foot one, cisgendered, alpha, heterosexual, New Yorker man who creates a lot of deterrent energy to ward off anybody who wants to pick a fight with me. Sure. Uh, and I deal with gunshots and stabs and stabbing victims on a daily basis. Emergency room. They, it doesn't. I run towards fires. Right. So I, I create an aura whenever I'm walking on the city that a lot of, makes a lot of people look at me and they're like, not worth my time. Right. Uh, I remember in high school, after my growth spurt, a bunch of us got mugged, and it, when it was my turn, it was down a line actually, and it was my turn. I was at the end of the line. They were like, nah, <laughs> nah, not worth it. They literally walked away. I was offended. Right. Uh, so come on yeah, you're, you're the like, john wick you're the john wick you're like running towards the fires bulletproof. you're like the guy I, who's like come on don't don't be that stupid today don't i mean i was ready to i was like come on i'm, I'm, I'm a team player you know and he was just like not worth it I, I, and i just went to get i do sense that energy when i'm on the subway or public transportation when this was starting out right people would look and i feel that but i just know that i mean i've been in new york all my life i know when people are just like yeah not really uh and no that's why they pick on more vulnerable um, sure. people out there in my communities to attack. So I, I, I don't want to negate that or invalidate that experience. I'm sure it happens, but it has not happened to me. The sure. worst was it working. I, I still remember was when a patient sheepish, sheepishly said, I think I have COVID and, and they look great. And I was like, why is that? And they kind of awkwardly as you know, saw that I, his doctor was Asian American was like, well, I saw an Asian person cough across the room <laughs> in my work. And I'm like, well, did, did, then what happened? What else? And then as, as if as I like, needed more, and it's like, did you like go, go up and kiss this man? Did you cough? Did you cough in his face back? Or did you make out with this person? And, the, and then he started, I, I deflected the humor. And the wife was like, I am so sorry. <laughs> and realized, and he took his hand and was like, I think, you know, you're going to be fine. And the man realized, it's like, oh, you're right. And actually said, I don't, I think I'm fine. I just needed someone to talk to. And you were great. Like, thanks for making me laugh. I'm so sorry. I, he apologized. And, you know, discharged himself. Um, wow. And didn't want anything. And this is in the and, ER, right? Sorry? This was in the ER? This is in the ER. That's a very and expensive it, therapy visit, by the way. <laughs> I agree. But, you know, I think he got a different kind of therapy, which sure, was which is good. cognitive reframing and change the shift in perspective. And didn't feel bad about it. I didn't yell at him. I didn't right. get upset. I deflected it with humor uh, and the levity. But that's my, that's my privilege. Like, no, this is a man that. that could understand the joke. Uh, in an area where I expected them to and where I felt comfortable and was well supported in case anything bad happened. Luckily didn't, but that was the, the most I've ever experienced during this. Yeah. That's it's, it's interesting that you say that. And I relate being um a being happened being a Muslim American, I will relate to moments where people find out I'm Muslim and then there's like a, you know, a character change or I want them to uh, but more specifically I have a 
a funny story I've never really told, but not to many people, I should say, definitely not on my podcast. After 9-11, being a Muslim American who felt like, okay, you guys, you can't put everybody on the same, like, stereotyping is a big thing to me. It's not just the racism. It's obviously stereotyping, right? So like you said, when they see an Asian person, they behave a certain way because they're stereotyping in their mind. And so I did, I got on a plane and I wasn't really a person who walked around with a Quran, but I wanted to walk down the center aisle of the airplane with my Quran simply because, not to actually agitate, I wanted someone to ask me a question. I wanted someone to engage me in whatever whatever questions they might have. And it worked because, of course, I sat down and the person next to me, I started reading it and she was like, oh, what is that? <laughs> I was like, oh, it's the Quran. And then, oh, you're Muslim? And I was, you know, and it just, it, it started a conversation and I was able to share a part of myself and it did, it changed it. So I definitely relate to that. I think how you handle it and how you look at it and that perspective is wise and should, you know, people... We, you know, I've, I get it. And like you, you have to educate and give someone an opportunity to, to grow. And so I love that you did that. Tell me a bit about Monsoon Diaries a little bit more. Share with us what what prompted you to start that and really kind of dive into Monsoon Diaries, if you don't mind. Yeah. First of all, thank you for sharing that story. I mean, that gives the credence to the fact that people can change their opinions and prejudices based on just humanizing yourself. Unfortunately, it is upon our energy to you know do things like that to humanize ourselves when we don't have to uh and that is a good segue to what the monsoon diaries uh, was born out of was trying to understand myself as a human being and humanizing the world where to me at the time it didn't make quite make any sense uh, i needed to take a proactive approach in engaging in the world that uh seemed to me was very boxed in and uh, siloed and it was all inadvertent completely accidental uh, it's not like I sought out to create a travel blog. I wasn't seeking to form a travel community. If anything, I was more of a reluctant uh, traveler. Uh, I lost a bent to a girl I met while bartending uh, back in 2010 that led me to an accidental trip uh, to Egypt. And it's a long story, but I, I found myself in Egypt for three weeks uh, in the winter of 2010, where I was supposed to be taken care of by uh, a best friend of mine that was supposed to be there at the time, a friend of mine from college who was Egyptian, who was local, who was going to take me in, and the girl, um, but all of whom only spent one day with me each before leaving me alone for three weeks by myself because uh, the winter of 2010 was uh, a different time. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I ended up the first week, I remember, remember the first day I was deciding whether or not I should go home as well with them. And... Uh, they you know, even said like, you should, you don't know anyone here, nobody knows you, you didn't plan anything, you were supposed to spend three weeks with us, but you ended up, are you gonna you know, do this alone? I don't think it's safe. And I was like, you're right. And then walking around circles and deciding, you know what, I'm here. If I stay, there's a 100% chance, uh, if I know, if I leave, there's a 100% chance I'll live and 100% chance I'll regret it. If I stay, there's a 100% chance I won't regret it. But you know, 30, 40% chance, 20% chance, I, I'm not going to be okay. Who, who knows? Uh, but either way, I just took a one-way ticket to Alexandria and I just went. Wow. Uh, the first week was terrible. I was like, this traveling thing is sucks. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I don't know where to eat. I don't know where to stay. I had no nothing, no internet, no cell phone, didn't bring anything. and only rely on myself. Hated that feeling wow. without realizing that's like, oh, I don't like myself. Uh, but I, it was very subconscious. This is me looking back. Second week, I was like, huh, I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm doing something right. And all I can, you know, rest a little eye on is just myself and the kindness of strangers. And then it wasn't until the third week, I was like, oh, I get it. This is why people travel. It took me three weeks being dragged, kicking and screaming by the universe or whatever force out there there was uh, to appreciate something that most people love already, like don't take for granted. And when I came back, I started a travel blog and started traveling alone. Uh, and that led me to losing my bet to apply to medical school, which got me into medical school by accident. And then the next part was to see if I could do both at the same time. And then what the Monsoon Dyers ended up becoming was Forrest Gump. That scene where he's running around the country alone just because. And they were asking, are you doing this for world peace? Are you doing this for women's rights? And he's just like, I just feel like running. Right. Uh, I just felt like traveling. And then people started following because of that genuine authentic authenticity of what he was doing. Yeah. He turn around and it'd be hundreds of people behind him. And he's like, okay. And just kept running. That's what the monsoon diaries has become. 
thousands mm-hmm. and thousands of people around the world just show up at airports uh, or show up at you know the hostel. And I'm like, who are you? And they're like, oh, I'm here to join your trip. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then keep going and they can leave. They can split off, join back again. They I can keep it. going all the way. There's no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. Don't take it. I just do all the work in making sure all the things are planned as if I was traveling alone and people hop on and I do all the work for them. And then at the end, if they like it, they pay me back for what they owe. And most people, in fact, everyone likes it. Uh, and then uh, a community was formed. And now we turn into this more of a streamlined business uh, so that it's more standardized. So everyone's safer, but the general spirit is there. There's no strict itinerary. We just hit everything that needs to be hit, but in no particular order. We just, once we hit the ground, it's whatever happens, happens. And right. you have free time built into it. So you can leave and join back again. And some people have fallen in love and we left them there for a year. So wow. I'll pick them up. Yeah. That's so it's so cool. You, it's whatever you make of it. Yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, and as a cancer survivor, I am very fond of traveling, right? I'm sure as a doctor, you're not unfamiliar with this, you know, the the bucket list, the uh, because people always tell me, you know, and, and I love it. And thank you for everyone who always congratulates me on surviving cancer. But then I'm like, OK, but I'm still alive. You realize I can still die from something else. And I definitely have a very... And I'm like you, I, I've, learned, I've learned to run towards the trauma now. Now that I've gone through so much in my life, I want to help others and I want to help them see what rebuilding looks like. And, and, and you know, to speak to what you said earlier, and, and in, in that, I'm very fortunate in the sense I happen to be Muslim, yes, but I am, you know, in a community where, and I'm of a, of a status, quote unquote, that I can, I can pretty much dictate how I'm treated, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not subjected to being treated by people badly because I can create my own circumstances. And the the part that i love about traveling is it makes me feel alive it makes me feel like i have something to look forward to and i have to say that in some of my fellow cancer fighter, fighters who have n- have since died traveling was so critical it was so it was the most horrible thing when the doctor would say you're not going to be able to go on your trip you know because we fought we fight for that. And so it's something I've, I have had distinct moments and distinct places that it's just been so overwhelming. Where have you been in the world that you have felt like this? Everywhere. I really can't. I can't choose favorites. I'm like you can't choose favorites among your children. Uh, it, it's not about where you go. It's how you do it. The Monsoon Diaries is Essentially, uh, we're trying to give a solo experience for a group of people or group trip people or group travel for people who hate group traveling. And what we mean by that is that uh, it's really the, the the experiences that you surround yourself with in the environment that you create for yourself and the people around you that we have on these trips uh, elaborate upon that environment so that you can be find happiness anywhere. So when you go home, you realize that you have it in within yourselves to create your own happiness. Uh, as I'm looking up, as I'm speaking about this, I'm looking at the world and it's just, you know, all these places I've been, I, I can't really pick one that has made me feel, felt so alive. I only can speak to experiences in different right, uh, right. Um, countries. And that's the same thing with, you know, partners and you know, relationships and family members. Like it's really moments and experiences you have. And at the end of the day, like a lot, I love solo traveling, don't get me wrong, but the Monsoon Diaries is, is for even for me, the solo travel needs to realize that it's always more fun to have a co-pilot. Yes. It's always more fun to share that with other people, even if they're strangers. And that's what we do. We have a group of people who all hate other people <laughs> when they travel, who then get together and say, like, hey, you're not so bad. And then end up with 10 new best friends, even if we never see each other again. We know that no matter who we get married to or end up with committing for a long time, uh, whoever you know we love or you know our children, we'll never understand the experiences that we had in that right. particular country. But I will give you some extent. What I'll give you two. One recent one was the Iron Ore Train in Mauritania. It was free. You hop on, hop off, and it's totally out of the element, and you're not uh, impeding on any of the locals' lifestyle. It's just an iron ore train that transports iron ore from the land to the sea for export, and you know locals hop on it to deliver food for the family in the villages out in the Sahara Desert, uh, and you know tourists hop on it just for the experience and you don't hurt anybody. Nobody has to bend over backwards for you. No one has to arrange it for you. Uh, it's completely sustainable and uh, no one really is, you know, has to, you know, what do you call that? Like, look, you know, just go out of their way to help a tourist. It's, right. it's all on you, which I loved about it. And it's completely like raw and real and real life. 
And then the only country I go back to over and over and over and over again, even though I promised never to go back to the same place twice is India, because every day in India is just like every day in New York City. Uh, mm. Every day is a story. Uh, I find that in most other countries as well, but India is the only one that's consistently every day I have a new story. Wow, that's interesting. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And that's exactly what I meant. You know, it is those moments. I totally know what you're saying. <laughs> like, I get it. Um, because I can't pick a favorite either. I mean, it's just you go and you have you have this moment. I, I remember one in Ibiza where I was like just sitting in the pool and I'm just and I was like, I dreamed of this moment for years. And now that I'm here, I'm just going to enjoy it, you know, and just that moment and satisfaction. And it's funny because I have to connect you then or right, share with your group with one of my best friends for over 20 something years one of my best friends his name is Keith he lives up in San Carlos and we used to be roommates years and years ago and then we weren't and so he's he's been a single guy he's not gotten married yet he's going to hate me for saying that on the podcast but he hasn't gotten married yet no kids so he just traveling is his thing and even coronavirus you know it's kind of interesting because I'm so used to having a conversation with him and saying, so where are you going? Where are you, where are you texting me from right now? You know, are you on an airport going to, you know, Austria? Are you going, you know, where are you going? And he always does this most amazing thing, though. I have to tell you, every, for years, I have a, a whole book. He sends me a postcard from every single place. And over the years when I was younger and I didn't have the opportunity to go and travel abroad, I would always get these amazing postcards and he would send these messages of friendship and just support. And and I was like, and it was the greatest souvenir because it was small, cheap, you know, and, and you just pick them up so easily. The one thing that's cheap in any country is a postcard. And our friendship over this year is all these postcards that I have but what's great is now there's a portion of my life now where I'm like okay now I have gone and sent him pick postcards from you know Saint Tropez or whether it's London or wherever all these places he once upon a time sent me or maybe even not I love it when I get to a place where he hasn't gone by the way but he you know it is true he's single and he finds groups he finds people just platonic friends to go travel with and it's what keeps him going so I'm gonna have to tell him about yours for sure I'm love definitely to have <laughs> I'm and definitely not to, to Again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when we can travel again, exactly. That's kind of the, you know, the, the 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 difficulty. How hard is it for you not to travel right now? In that sense, it is uh, a deprivation of a sense that I used to enjoy um, in terms of how to balance out my other life as a doctor. Mm. Uh, the, the life is a balance. It's I can't do just one thing. Right. I, if I I like to get to the point where if I work too much in ER start missing traveling and then I try then I would use the monsoon diaries and then it's just convenience right there so once I start oh I miss traveling oh wait I have a trip tonight holy shit that's like that is like my life and then when I travel so much I realize oh man I miss working the ER no right. problem the trip's almost over right. I'm gonna be working tomorrow in ER so that's that's how my life is structured this is just a new challenge sure trying to figure out you know how to you know take on a new experience as if it was a new country I guess that's the way I cognitively reframe my situation right now that this is a new travel experience, my home. I, I agree. I agree. And I was just saying, I, my, when my best friend does watch this episode, by the way, especially because she's such a, a huge fan of yours, she is going to, and supporter of yours, she is going to laugh because we were having this exact, I was telling her, I kind of have this knot. I said, I feel more stressed because my husband is in film and we, and I'm in film as well in media. And I always am gone to the film festivals. We were, we had a film that was premiering at Tribeca Film Festival. We were supposed to be in New York in April, which got canceled. Then we usually go to Cannes and then we usually spring off from there and then you know and then there's Toronto and it's very and that's not including our our fun trips in the middle of that right those are just work trips but of course because it's with film it's always a little fun and I was saying I just I sense a different sen uh, amount of stress within me because I feel I haven't been able to relinquish that and even if it's work it is always nice to just go somewhere be somewhere different and I love you know being in these beautiful places throughout the world but I agree with you definitely time to check out our own our own cities and and fall in love with uh, our backyards again. So thank you so much for actually taking the time and have this conversation. Dr. Sun, before I let you go, I do want to ask you, you know, if you have a message for anyone out there, you know, right now from your heart as, you know, just as another human being, another person who, who loves this country and everything uh, and does so much, obviously, for it every day, for everyone, not just people of this country, by the way, but people in general, what is your message to anyone listening? You're not alone. You are never alone. Whatever you go through right now, the reason why you're very here in this place is because somebody else struggled to get you there. And we only have one direction in this 
timeline and it's forward. And you may feel that uh, things can be very stressful and get you down and the world may not be working out for you, but that is the very point of living. It's never one direction. It's not about what you become in a linear timeline. It's how you get there. The destination doesn't really matter so much the journey and it's going to be full of ups and downs. And when you look back on your life one day, when it's no more life, much left life to live, I want you to be able to get to the point where you can be grateful that you lived an up and down left and right kind of experience where it's so colorful and you'd be grateful that you, you can have stories rather than something that was just one linear line towards a single point because life is not a, it actually life isn't a journey in itself life is a dance and when we pee, when we say that uh that we go to concerts or dance a dance it the best thing we live life is assuming that the best dance is to dance as fast as possible to a room or go to the co concert that's always a finale or the conductor conducts as fast as the dj dj's the fastest uh, and that's not how to live all right we enjoy we go to a concert to enjoy every minute of it and we go to a dance to enjoy every minute of it we don't think about the end and I, that's why I beseech upon you to how you live life to know that no matter how difficult it is, just even enjoy that um, because it's a feeling is a feeling, but it's really the meaning behind and the action that comes out of that feeling that really means more and just to focus on that. So yeah, you're not alone in that, those thoughts. Thank you for that message. I appreciate it. If uh, for our listening audience, uh, your IG handle or where you prefer people to reach out to you for support or just to get more information on you. Sure. I am best reached on uh, Facebook and Instagram, both of which is Monsoon Diaries, M-O-N-S-O-O-N-D-I-A-R-I-E-S in one word, or I like to say Monsoon Wedding plus Motorcycle Diaries is how we came up with the name. Uh, you can also find me regularly, Calvin D. Sun. I'm more, uh, if you want to come to me personally, it's Monsoon Diaries on the Instagram or Calvin D. Sun on Facebook. I respond to everything and I look forward to hearing from you. You, you do. I attest to that. Thank you so much for answering us when we reached out to you to be our, our guest and be part of this conversation with me. I truly appreciate it. And I look forward to speaking to you again in the future and maybe doing some traveling one day. <laughs> uh, to Inshallah, our we will hopefully come back and do this in person. For sure. For sure. Uh, to our audience, thank you so much uh, for information on more about even me and even the book. I know I don't often share about my books, but for more information on that, you can go to www unsugarcoatedmedia.com we look forward to seeing you again uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future take care and thanks for letting us be unsugarcoated bye bye <laughs>